Today we're going to talk about knowledge, understanding the stuff that you are selling. There's more to it than just looking up some price on eBay or looking in a book. You got to know a little more than that to actually score and do well at what we do. Hey, it's Don. Today we're going to talk a little bit about knowledge, knowing more than the other person. And as I've said in many, many, many different videos, it's not about being able to look something up on eBay. Many times an eBay search won't give you what you want. A large majority of the um, intricate uh, small niche areas and stuff that we do extremely well and you're not going to find the average price for most anything that we sell on eBay. You're going to have to come up with it in a different way. Records are another example. I do use other sites for things like that to price, but you got to have all the basics, the solid knowledge in the categories that you go into. This goes for records, for an example. A record has dead wax. That's the section between the spindle hole and where the label is. Inside there on many of the earlier LPs and things, there'll be matrix numbers scratched into there. If you don't know how that works, you may think you have a first pressing of something. And simply because it doesn't have one little number, you're off. You can sell it wrongly. You can get some bad dings from misidentifying things like that as well. And just because, again, you look it up on eBay doesn't mean you know everything about the item itself. Now, we're going to look at some specifics. We're going to show you a few guidebooks here that I use. And we'll show you why even having a price guide for many of these categories, comics, stamps, coins, um, posters, any kind of thing like that, even toys, even action figures, you can miss some of the most important aspects. You can sell something that's worth a ton of money for almost nothing you can buy spend a lot of money on something thinking it's worth a ton of money because you did a quick search on ebay get home and find out that there's some other factor that that person didn't know sale never went through who knows you've got to have all the inside information on the items you're selling to make the most money that's how i can go out to places that sell as a dealer just like me and still make some good money because they don't know what they're doing in every category that they sell in a majority of people People don't mess with smalls because they just don't see the money in it. They want to sell a big expensive vase, Rookwood, Weller, something like that. Some high-end furniture, high-end vintage clothing, um, gold, jewelry, things like that. So anyway, let's hop over and I'm going to give you some real solid examples of why the guidebooks aren't very good if you don't know all the information and facts about the items that you're looking up. So I have four buttons in my hand. Only one of these is from the Civil War. All the other ones are from a much later period. Now, I usually show people this one and they're over and they talk about how do you tell and things like that. I usually give an example like this. First thing they say is, well, can I get a book on it? Well, yes and no. The book isn't going to be helpful if you don't have another book to go with it to identify other aspects of it. And this goes for glassware, toys, you name it. Like with action figures, for an example, there are some Star Wars, original 1970s Star Wars action figures that are marked differently. They were made in Mexico and they're marked differently. That's not in most of the price guides that you'll run into. It doesn't say that. You have to know that information to do well. I know people have bought the rarer versions on eBay because they weren't marked as such and got them for a steal and were able to turn around and resell them and make hundreds of dollars for that reason. Now, if you look these up on eBay, these are general service Civil War Army buttons, you're going to see a ton that say, yeah, these are all Civil War. Probably eight out of 10 of the ones that I see just by the average seller on eBay are not from the Civil War. They don't know the right information to be able to tell. So if I ask somebody, usually this is the one they always point to by the looks of it. Turning it over, there's no way on earth that's a Civil War button. They didn't make backs like that. That's a self-shank, it's called, and they don't look like that. Now, you won't know that by buying the book, and we're going to show you the books in just a minute here. Now, this is another one. This is a self-shank that's even worse than the other one. Again, these two would probably date to 1910 or so. These are faux buttons, basically. They're not made uh, to be worn on a, a uniform, so to speak. Now, this one here is a normal button. It's a shank button. It has a back mark that you will see written 
identically wording wise letter wise in some of the books but it's not written right this one though it may match what's in the price guide isn't correct this is modern this is from the the 20th century this was probably made in 1930s or 40s as a reproduction for reenactors and things like that the only real one is this one right here which has a very specific style of a stamping on the back of the button that's called RMDC, raised mark in a depressed channel. Now, I've talked about this in many other videos. It's these little distinguishing factors that can mean the difference between you making 10 bucks or making hundreds of dollars in so many items. Action figures, stamps are one of the biggest ones. I can buy stamps almost anywhere that are misidentified or that have some high values in it just because the people didn't know how to look them up properly. You can get the guides, but if you don't know, say, colors in a stamp, a rose, a carmine, vermilion, um, just a, a red, dark red, there's, there's like five or six different colors of just red that are used on U.S. postage stamps. And one difference in color variation can mean the difference in value from a couple hundred bucks to two cents. So it, even if you have the books, if you don't know how to properly use them, you're not going to do very well at all. Now, this is Alpheus H. Albert's Record of American Uniform and Historical Buttons. And this is the Bicentennial Edition from 1976. Well, it has a 77, but it's the 76 Bicentennial. I've used this book for 20 plus years very, very uh, deeply. I've even marked pages with certain information in the book. Now, let's look up this button here. So looking at buttons specifically, let's zoom in a little bit more here. Now, I can look in the book, and I can see that the designs are correct in here. So these, both of these designs here match what the design basically looks like in here. Now, knowing that these could have been made by 20 different companies, the, there's going to be a variation in them. There's also two different designs. This is the earlier style, and this is more a modernized late 1880s, 90s era so it's basically the same thing, but you could easily mix those two up if you only had one or the other one. You may mix up that difference. Now, even looking over here at the description, again, we're just sliding over on the same page here. Um, even up here, it lists what the back mark would be written. Now, this one says RMDC. So if you're not paying attention, don't know what RMDC means, you're not going to realize that that's what this button is. Again, this is an RMDC back mark. Now, this is a Waterbury Button Company back mark here. Now, if you're not paying attention, you might read into that that that's what this is. Many of these just give you a description of what it says on the back, not how it's written. There's no explanation or photos on that. Again, this goes for anything that you're into. Glassware is notorious for doing this. Now, this book doesn't tell you uh, company names or ones that would be fake. There's no information really about that in here because this is just an identifying guide. Now, there's other guides, other things you would need to identify it. So how would I know these are good buttons? Even if you have Alberts, the fronts of the buttons can look just like what you want them to look like. They could be all good as gold by this book here. Some of the companies that made buttons, though, didn't make them until a certain time frame because they didn't exist. The companies weren't founded until the 20th century or 1890s. So there's no way a company name, a very specific one, could be on certain buttons because they didn't make them like that. Now, this book is very helpful because in the back of this, on top of having the names of every button maker uh, that's pretty well known, obviously there's a few we've run into that aren't in this book, but... It tells you when they existed, when they were founded. It gives you a general idea on um, which type of buttons they made, who they made them for, um, the time frame they were in existence. This company here, Mitzer, very well-known one, 1839 to 1869. So, and again, it's possible to find some of the backs, some of the wrong information on buttons that couldn't have been made by the company. Sometimes in a warehouse, they may have backs and put them on modern-day buttons just to save money. And if you don't know that information, you're really missing out. Now, here's the identifiable information in the back. It's got pictures. And with the pictures, you can date them very, very closely. Uh, like a raised mark depressed channel button. Early 1850s. Some of them go back to the 1840s. It just depends on how it's written. And it goes into all of them. It gives you some very good examples, nice illustrations, some good photos of the ones uh, that are going to be helpful to you. Let me see. I think the rest of them are back here that yeah, Waterbury. So here we're looking at Waterbury. And when you look in here, you're going to be able to see most of the modern day versions of these back marks. 
Now, even though this button here has the same basic uh, writing on it, it has an extra M. So it's not the same exact back mark. When these books show something, it has to be exactly the same to what you see in this book. But this isn't the last word on a lot of these items because another person made another book years, decades after this that updated this information. So even if you have this book, you've got these first two books here, there's another book that will further help you to correctly identify them because more information was found later on. Now this is Warren Tice's book here, and this is Uniform Buttons of the United States. This doesn't cover anything past 1865. Even though it might show buttons in here and say they're 1865, again, if the back marks aren't correct, the buttons aren't correct from that time frame. Now, what's good about this one here, it has updated images of all of the back marks, and it pretty much dates them very, very, very nicely. 20th century, this one has con, C-O-N-N. -N. All of the ones that say con are 20th century, but again, the front, don't pay any attention to the size of the button in this case. Uh, the front's what matters, the image itself. These buttons were made in many different sizes. So you can find one that looks identical to this one here with this exact same back mark. So the size means nothing. There's even bigger ones, smaller ones as well. There's four, five, even six different sizes in some cases of some buttons. But without these books, without the other books here, you can't correctly identify what you have. Even if you have one, even if, let's say you buy every glass one out there, you can find you're, you're collecting depression glass. Most of the depression glass books I've run into don't tell you every way that people fake them. Every way that people will grind down the repo uh, impression or bossing or a copyright date so that they can pawn items off as old, even though they are not. Um, postage stamps, the same thing. They've made reproductions that are valid postage here in the United States. They may be a different size, but people try and trick people because they don't pay enough attention. Now, here's a guide on British buttons. And what you'll find in most of the guides like this on foreign buttons are a long range of dates that they use the specific design. So this design, it doesn't matter which one, we're just trying to give you an example, was used from 1881 through 1934. Now, obviously, the ones that are the oldest are the hardest to come by. They would be in Victorian era. And Victorian buttons are highly sought after, original ones to fill in uniform pieces. When a uniform is missing something, they want the items. This goes for dishes, this goes for pottery, this goes for, geez, coins especially. One little tiny variation in a coin can mean the difference in a lot of money. Uh, double die error on a 1955 penny. If you don't know what you're looking at, you may miss something like that. You may miss a $100, $200 penny because you haven't a clue. Even if you knew it existed, you may not realize what you're looking for. Like with this one here in the dates, the back mark is the only way to tell when the button was made. Again, you need to track down that information. So even if you have books, that date doesn't mean that every button you find was made between that time frame. It means that that face design was. Same thing goes for silverware, um, sterling, all that sort of thing. Plates, cups, saucers. All that sort of thing can have reproductions that look the same. Uniforms. Uh, vintage dresses, clothing, tuxedo, everything, you name it, there's various different reasons why one thing may have been made at a different time than another. Now here's yet another identifying guidebook. This one has no information on the backs of the buttons. So again, if you don't know the backs, even though you're able to identify the fronts, you're missing a ton of information. So even if you can identify what's on the face of the buttons, you may be missing the fact on dating. A lot of these buttons were made for collectors later on, after a lot of these companies stopped existing. And again, that goes for China, that goes for silver, where you'll see knockoffs, fakes, reproductions, intentionally done just for the collector's market. Many of these books will have date structures in them. They say the company was founded in a specific date. Um, even on the information on when your item possibly could have been made, they're stating on when the back mark was possibly used. Again, this doesn't correspond to the books that we're talking about either. You have to have other information. So even though, let's say, you're selling railroad items, this is a railroad-specific book here. It's just railroad items. You still have to have military books in some cases to identify when the item was made. 
This goes for pretty much everything that I sell, even Christmas cards, for an example. If you don't know some interesting facts or maker dates, how they mark their things like Hallmark cards, for an example. Vintage Hallmark cards are marked differently at various times, and you can date a Hallmark card by how it's marked on the back. Older ones are far more expensive and will sell far better than new ones. So if you can understand the markings on the stuff that you are selling, it will do you wonders. So just having a book or being able to look it up on eBay may not be helpful to you at all. You've got to have the underlying experience at least or knowledge or interest in it to do well. Anybody can understand these. You just have to spend the time into it. You can't just be a casual seller and say, I'll just look it up on eBay every time because that's not going to work. That's why people buy things off eBay that are worth a lot of money and the seller who sold them had no clue. Or you go to an auction and you buy some horrendously valuable stuff for almost nothing again because they don't know all the information that a true diehard niche seller knows. That's how I make more money than other people. That's how I make money from people who have some of these books still because they don't know how to use them correctly or they don't know that other information supersedes some of the other guides that they're using. Older guides aren't as useful as the newer ones because new things are found all the time. So a 15 or 20 year old guide could be pointless. If there's a new one out that goes into great detail on reproductions, copies, fakes, new patterns found, issues found, and all of that sort of thing. But anyway, that's what I have for you today. Well, there we have it. Hopefully that gave you some ideas, some thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button down below. You can also hit the bell icon to be notified if I post new content or go live. Subscribe and tell all your friends. Thank you.